John chapter 4. You notice the boxes are gone. I emptied them out. We're done with the one another commandments, done with the church, and we're moving in a different direction, a direction that I believe God would want for me to d deal with. And we're looking at the miracles of Jesus over the next few weeks, maybe even a couple of months. Uh, next week, I'll give you a heads up. It's when, uh, when a demon comes to church. Um, and so next week, we'll watch Jesus single out a man who is sitting listening to him teach and worshiping in the synagogue and nobody has a clue that that man has a demon and Jesus is going to take care of that guy right there in church that's next week and the title of this message Jesus is back and so it'll probably be towards the end before that truth jumps out at you but we're in John chapter 4 verse 40 through 43 through 54 now I would if you are able, I really would like for you to read along with me or at least follow the words as I read. And I'm going to ask you two questions before I even do so. I want you to look for the obvious. What is the obvious as you read this? Now, the obvious for you and the obvious for me and for others may be different, but there's going to be something as we read it and as you read it that's, that you're going to go, okay, I see that. I mean, it's obvious to you. But then I want you to look for what is the wow? What in this scripture causes you, your heart, to go, oh, wow? Verse 43. Now, after the two days, that is the two days that he was in Sychar and Samaria. Um, now, after the two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. I, that seems totally out of place in the context. It's talking about him leaving Samaria, not Nazareth. And so I'll be honest with you, I don't know why that's there. I'm still, I've been studying, and, I, and everybody just kind of skips the fact that, well, why is it here? You know, if he was in Nazareth or just left Nazareth or going to Nazareth, okay. Um, but I don't, have a, I don't have a clue, and I can't answer that question for you, all right? So, um, so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had, in other words, he's back. Jesus is back to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman or royal individual, one who was, had power with the, with the Romans, probably a Gentile, whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him, he went to him and he implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. This man of power, this nobleman, this man of this royal official said to Jesus, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way. Believe me. Your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then the man inquired of his servants the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, which is 1 p.m. in the afternoon, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour, at the same time, in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed in this whole household. This again is the second sign or wonder or miracle Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. Father, I, Father you set the plow deep. Where there is rock and stones, you just push them out of the way. Where the ground has become hardened, 
because of man's own intentions of rebellion. And I pray, Father, that you would you would plow a straight line through it. And may that which you desire to plant and to stir in the hearts of those within hearing, may your miracle of planning take place. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what's the obvious? Probably different for each of you. This is my third time this week unpacking this. Um, I will go ahead and warn you, I have struggled with it because every time I've unpacked it, it's never been less than an hour and a half. And so I, I, I even told the last group, I said, um, you need to be praying for me come Sunday because there's no way I'm going to take an hour and a half. And so I've tried to bring it to a place where I can share it with you. But as I've asked the question, what is obvious it's been all over the place. Some singled out the rebuke that Jesus gave to this man whose son is dying. Some singled out the, the fact that, of the miracle. The miracle is what I saw as the obvious. There comes Jesus does heal this sick son. That was the obvious. And then I began to ask myself the same question I'm asking you. What's the wow? In almost every case, there was almost silence. There was silence with me. And when God first, I was sitting in my office, uh, I was waiting on Jim uh, for come for a Bible study, and I was sitting in my office, and I had j just about was going through this and getting ready, and I had just asked, I felt God was asking me, what's the obvious? And I said, the miracle, the obvious. He said, what's the wow for you? And I didn't have one. And that's what troubled me. Anytime God reveals a healing and tells the story, I ought to go, wow. The power and amazement of God should wow me. But you see what happens is familiarity kills us of the, of the wow. I know this story. You know this story. You read it looking at it with your eyes. And I guarantee it that most of you weren't wowed by it. We're no longer amazed at the power and the incredibleness of God. And so God tells a story. And that's the amazing thing. Let me give you a little bit about the difference between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew is writing to Jewish, Jewish believers. So his whole intention is helping the Jews understand that Jesus is the Messiah. That's his whole purpose. Mark. Mark is writing to the Hellenistics that are the Greek Jews, helping them to know that Jesus, that they're not outcasts, that Jesus goes out of his way for the Hellenists too. Luke. Luke has a major task. He has to convince, he has to help Nero, the emperor of the whole Roman world, understand who Jesus is. So he writes Luke, and then he writes Acts, and he writes it all about to try and give a defense for Paul who's about to lose his head. So Luke is historical, very historical, and it walks down through the whole thing. But John is the last of the Gospels almost 60 years after Jesus' death. John is not focused on historical accuracy. That's why you don't find the Christmas story. And it doesn't go chronologically. He deals with seven wonders, seven powers, seven mights. He deals with Jesus in relationship to who he is. In other words, from the very beginning, it is who is this one? First, he's the word. He is God in the flesh. And so that's the whole focus. And so, John, you have to read it in large blocks. And I just read... The last of it I read the end and John chapter 4 verses 40 through 3 through, through the end of the chapter does not make sense to you and I if we only read that part because you see this particular story that he is telling starts in chapter 2 with verse 1 
And it's a, it's a whole, and John does that over and over again. He gives one whole story, and then he gives another whole story. But you and I, we're so, we're so, well, I don't have time for all that. So we miss it. He's telling a story about the wildness of this Jesus. Now, I can do that in my own life. I, I can tell the first wild moment, the first wild moment in me was when I, at my kitchen, my grandparents' kitchen table, I said my first prayer, I asked Jesus into my life, and oh my goodness, he exploded in me. I can tell the second wild moment. The second wild moment was shortly thereafter when I began to pray an 18-year-old boy who just saw the power of God in his life take him from darkness into light, take him from hell into heaven. From that second prayer I prayed, Lord God, I've been alone all of my life. I've never dated, held a hand of a girl, never kissed a girl. Lord God, I don't want to be alone. Please give me a friend and please let it be a woman. And God did that. Almost immediately, God led me to Trish. She wasn't hardly even, well, she wasn't 16. Don't go into all that back in there. But God brought Trish into my life. The first person I ever shared Jesus with, the first person I ever led to the Lord, I watched her grow, and I've watched her grow from the time we met on to this day. God took me from here. He took me to there. Then the third one, right before we're supposed to get married, my third prayer, I go to pick her up at the high school. Yeah, she was still in high school. I go to pick her up at high school for lunch, and there's an ambulance in the, in the parking lot, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting. The ambulance lights come on, and it leaves, and I wait, and I wait, and her friend Gabby, who was really Gabby, comes running out to tell me it was Trish. An ambulance, and she had had an accident. And they were taking her to Grundy County Hospital. Run to the hospital. I beat her parents. I'm just a boyfriend. They won't tell me anything. I wait for her parents to come, and I listen from a distance as the doctor says to them, it's bad. Real bad. She's dying you believe in prayer you need to do something well her parents didn't so I went downstairs into what was a little chapel in that hospital and for about almost 20 hours I prayed the same prayer over and over again Lord you gave her to me give her back and whoa they come down they tell me what has happened the doctor even says I don't know what's wrong but she's going to be all right and God gave me another one and I can go on and on I can do the same thing <laughs> I don't usually share this one in church it scares people and they already think I'm a babacostal anyway and when I share this story they go hey, it's obvious he ain't Baptist <laughs> but I remember the first time I was called to do an exorcism I was a brand new preacher out of seminary. And I'm going to tell you, in Baptist seminaries, they don't tell you anything about exorcism. They don't even talk about that stuff. And so I remember when the call came for one of my deacons who didn't believe it either, but called me and said, you need to get over here. There's something really wrong going on in our home. So I run over there and then he tells me the story I'm not going to tell you the story and then he says we're going to leave you him and his wife got in the car and left me in that house yeah they didn't prepare me for that his son they knew he was coming his son where the demons were living walks in and sees me sitting in his living room the end of the story that deacon answers the call to ministry and becomes the pastor of the church literally just down the road from us and that son answers the call to the ministry as well I've done many more like that since then but that's my big wow healings 
Oh, my goodness. But the most powerful one that I ever saw with Trish was there. Dona Juanita had drank poison. Not because of Mark chapter 16. No, it was in Belize. She was in her, she looked like she was 2,000 years old, but she was probably, how old, she's dead now, so I don't have to worry about her hearing it. Um, she was about 70 something. I know that sounds old. It doesn't sound old to me anymore. I'm 63 and 70 is really, really close. That's only seven years from now. But some, she had been sick and somebody told her to do this stuff and she mixed it all up and she drank it. It was a concoction of Ben Gay and a whole bunch of other stuff and it just... And her husband, Don Juan, that sounds weird, don't it? But that was his name, Don Juan sent for the church, sent for me and me and Mr. Bardalis Mrs. Bardalis, our children and a few others came to this hut and there she was in that little bed as soon as you came in laying there and I remember walking in everything in my mind was saying she ain't going to make it we laid our hands on her and we prayed and literally within seconds, she was sitting up, fixing us drinks, and serving us. I wish that happened more often. Those are wow moments. You see, wow moments for you, you tell. You can't help it. You tell them. Because no matter how long ago it was, it still wows you. But it is a sad thing. When you've been following Christ all your life and you don't even think you have a single wow moment where you fight the same sins over and over again because you don't understand the wow moment of a deliverance. You end up giving up. You forget the power of your own salvation and the wild moment that took you from darkness into light, that took you out of hell and into his hands and into all the glory, you forget the wild moments. But God delights in writing them down and telling us about the wild moments. I'm going to, um, let's, let's go to that picture. That picture. <laughs> This is what usually takes a while. It looks a lot better to some of you. Some of it was just on a piece of paper or, or whatever. And this is the shorter version. Cana at the top. It's a journey of faith from John chapter 2 to chapter 4. There's two little stick figures over there to the side. It's 178 miles. The first time I said it, there was 100, 350 because I doubled my map. It's not 350. It's 178 miles it begins in Cana with the water being turned to wine in chapter 2. It ends in Cana. It's a round trip from Cana to Cana, and it's 178 plus miles to get there. There's several days, weeks to get there. There's several stops along the way. But John records a journey of faith, a path of faith. And so let me just walk you through it first. So in John chapter 2, the kind of faith that we find at Canaan when he first came there is whatever he says. It's the faith of his mother who walks up to him. Hey, son, there's a problem. Jesus says, hey, you know, Mom, it's not time. He, she, says, he, she says, I don't care. Looks at the servant and says, whatever he says you do. And she walks away. She walks away knowing that it's going to be done. What kind of faith does that? What kind of faith brings a situation to Jesus and says, here, even though you may hear his objections, you still walk away saying whatever he says do. What kind of faith does that? That is the perfect faith. It is a faith where there's no doubt. There's no questions. You know who he is. And you know his heart. You know what he's able to do. And you say, whatever he says. Well, when he lives Cana, guess where he goes? To Capernaum. Remember the man at the inn? Where is he from? Capernaum. It's 22 miles from Cana to Capernaum. When he comes to Capernaum, 
His mother and his brothers are with him as well as the disciples. When he leaves Capernaum, nothing happens in Capernaum. He doesn't stay there very long. But he does leave something in Capernaum. He leaves his mother and his brothers in Capernaum. But it's a faith of nothing. Mark talks about it. Mark talks about Jesus coming to a place and not doing any miracles there. And it literally says, because of their unbelief. He goes from whatever he says to nothing. He doesn't stay in Capernaum very long. He goes to Jerusalem to the feast. And in the feast, he does many miracles and wonders. It even says in that chapter that he does many signs and wonders in Jerusalem. But it doesn't tell us about those. John doesn't care. You see, Johnny's not, Johnny, Johnny, I don't know where Johnny came. John's not all about giving us all the facts and all the details. That's Luke. John just says he did many signs, but he doesn't count them as the second sign. Because you see, he's on, he's on a journey, a journey of faith, and he's talking about it. And, then, and when he gets there and he does the, the, the signs and he cleanses the temple, the, the religious leader says to him, we'll believe if you prove to us. You prove to us that you are the one in authority that can do the things you're doing. You prove to us. It's the kind of faith that says, I will believe if you do this. And that kind of faith has no place. He doesn't give himself to that. He leaves those priests and then he goes down in chapter 2, verse 23. It says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the post office, post office <laughs> you like that, Vanessa? Post office. <laughs> Passover. Uh, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. He knew what was in them. And the Bible says they believed in the signs, but, but they're still empty. It's an empty faith. It's a faith that only follows him for what they're going to get out of him. And when he stops giving it to them, then they abandon him. And he doesn't give himself to them. He doesn't commit himself to them. There is no wow moment in them, even though the Bible says they believe. But they don't have the kind of belief that causes himself to give himself to them. It's an emotional faith. It's a faith that causes you to run from one emotional buildup to one another. Years ago, when I was with the convention, I had a pastor, a good man. I, I love him deeply, and I understood his heart. He was in a very dry and thirsty place of ministry. And he said to me, he said, Don, if you're ever at a church that is on fire, where revival and spiritual awakening is taking place, you let me know because I don't care how far it is, I want to go there. And I said to him, that's sin. I said, that's sin. If God wanted you there, he would have called you there. God had placed you in a place of serving in the wilderness and a desert. But you don't like it. You don't want it. You want to run to the next sign. You need to know that Jesus does not commit himself. He may stay for a season, but he don't stay very long. Well, that's not, that's not the only thing there. Right after that, Nicodemus comes out to him. 
and we get John 3, 16, and, 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 and out of the blue, you wonder, what in the world is Jesus doing with this man named Nicodemus? And Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What kind of faith is he asking? You've got to believe, Nicodemus, that I'm not a rabbi because, see, that's what Nicodemus says. He calls him a great teacher, a one that has the anointing of God and sent by God, but is not God. And, God, and Jesus says to him, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. You've got to believe that I am the one God has sent. Well, he leaves from there and he goes, so... so you got whatever he says, nothing, faith. He will prove me. Oh, I'll follow you as long as there's signs and wonders taking place to a challenge. I believe that he is the Son of God. Well, where does he go next then? He goes into the Judean wilderness, which I forgot how I many. I didn't bring that piece of paper with all my miles and stuff down it some of you got notes and you probably got it don't hand it to me just keep it but I know I can't remember how many miles it was from there when he comes there John the Baptist is baptizing with his disciples Jesus comes there and it says Jesus is baptizing but later it says that Jesus never baptized anyone his disciples baptized them in his name and the disciples of John the Baptist come to John and say hey you know what's happening over there and John makes a statement that basically says, Wow, I am to decrease, and he is to increase. And then he makes this statement about faith. Verse 36 of John chapter 3. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. Nicodemus doesn't have it. John the Baptist does. And he challenges his own disciples to turn away from following him, to follow the one who is the Son of God. Well, he goes from there, he makes a side trip through Samaria, ends up in Sychar in the beginning of John chapter 4. And in Sychar, and again, I don't have my notes, so I can't tell you how many miles that is, and that's only important to an OCD guy like me, okay? All right? Now, I'm the only one that would actually sit down and figure up Google. Okay, okay Google, how far is it from the Judean wilderness to Sychar? How far is it from... Um, Jerusalem to the Judean only, only somebody like me really wants to know that that doesn't imply anything to you you just keep in the fact it's 178 miles total he's there with the Samaritan woman the disciples vanish they come back they're surprised that he's talking to a woman she goes running to the city and then in verse 39 we find and many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. Verse 41, and many more believed because of his own word. Did you notice something? Nicodemus is seeing signs and wonders. He even says to Jesus, nobody can do the things you're doing unless they've been sent by God. This woman doesn't see a single miracle. Not a single miracle. No signs. She only hears. The people of Samaria, of Sychar, they only hear. And faith explodes because the Bible says that faith cometh from hearing and hearing from the Word of God, and that has happened to her. So what is your problem? How many times have you heard the Word of God one time, your accountability in hell goes way up? You have no excuse. I have no excuse. You've heard many, many times, faith is supposed to come when the hearing of the word takes place. And you and I have a Gentile, half-Gentile, half-Jewish group of people, a whole city that comes to faith simply because they hear and they have not seen. They don't ask for proof. 
They don't, they have something far better than the high priest, far better than Nicodemus. The people in Capernaum don't have a clue. Faith comes by hearing. And then he leaves there, and he comes into Galilee. And Jesus makes a statement. Many of the people there in Galilee, according to verse 45, they come to him, they receive him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast. For they had been there too. They saw all the signs and wonders. And Jesus says, unless you people talking about all these Galileans, unless you see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. And basically what Jesus is saying is, I'm not looking for those kind of people. You may receive me, but I'm not going to receive you. I'm not looking for people that only follow me as long as I'm feeding the 5,000. As long as I'm casting out their demons. As long as there's an emotional disturbance around you. I'm not I'm not looking for people that have a faith that only lasts as long as the sign lasts. Oh my goodness. How many times have my eyes seen that? 43 years of ministry. How many times have I seen it here? Let's get wed. Let's, let's tell the world about a commitment that I'm, I'm only going to keep as long as he keeps performing. Let me show a commitment. that is only as strong as what I get out of it. And then he comes back to Canaan. And he finds a man from nothing. A man from Capernaum. A powerful man who has heard that Jesus has come and he travels the 22 miles at least two days he is hungry for a sign Jesus knows that he even confronts that in him along with everybody else The man pleads. You've got to, notice the word, you have to come with me. Now, my son is dying. He gives an order to Jesus. That's no surprise. Remember, he is a powerful man. He is a noble man. He is a man with power, with the Roman government power behind him. He's used to telling people what to do. It doesn't work with Jesus. Jesus says, you go. You leave me. Your son is healed. But he does. He makes that two-day journey back towards his son. He will have been away four days, and the day he left, it was so bad that he humbled himself to make a journey. 
for a day and a half. He only has faith. And then at the same time, well, 24 hours later, or whatever it is, at the same time when he's almost home, his servants who have been sent to tell him, I don't know whether you've talked to the healer, but your son's okay. But faith needs to come to these servants because they don't know about the conversation between Jesus and this man. So we ask the servant, what time? And they say one o'clock. And a big old grin comes over his face. And he says, do you know where I was at one o'clock? And when he gets home, he tells his wow moment to his whole family. And faith comes by hearing. You see the two stick figures? The one out front is supposed to be Jesus. Who's the one in the back? Is it the Samaritan woman? Is it Nicodemus? Is it this noble man? There's only one individual that has been in the midst of this story besides Jesus from the beginning to now. It's John. In chapter 1, God calls his disciples. And John is on a faith of journey as well. He's going to struggle at times. He's going to scratch his head when Jesus says, Let's go to somewhere else when there's a crowd of people there. He's on a faith of journey, too. At the beginning, he doesn't have the whatever he says faith. There will be times when he doesn't even have any faith. Though he will never express it, there were times when he sounded probably like the, or at least thought like the priest. Prove it to me, and I will believe. There were times when he could write and say that he is the son of God. But at the very end, he's still trying to figure it out. He hears a lot from the one who speaks the truth. Faith begins to grow and grow and grow. His faith, he's the one who stays at the cross to the end. And when you and I find him writing this, he has a faith that says whatever he says. He will write many more chapters, and he will record all of the wow moments that he witnessed for you and I to go wow. You're on a faith journey. Every single one of you are on a faith journey. At times, you will go through a period where you are demanding a sign. Someone you love deeply or maybe yourself will be in need of a miracle. And at that moment, you will pray like you've never prayed. And you will wait. And at some point, you'll have to decide. Even if he doesn't heal, will you still believe? Some of you have been on a faith journey because your life, some because of your own decisions, 
some because you've reaped what others have sown in your life and you feel like you've gotten the raw deal not the life you desire or would even seek and your faith is like a wave up and down you're having to decide whether Jesus is the one you're going to follow or man or woman or your own self you see some of you unfortunately haven't made it out of Capernaum you're just as dead with nothing and you've always been that way though God has come he's visited he has spoken he has shared he wants to wow you Maybe it's because you don't trust him. Maybe it's because you really like where you are already too much. But I'm on a faith journey too. And I have to be real careful. Especially when I tell my story. That it's not only built upon signs and wonders. Otherwise, I'll become like that pastor who will abandon his position, take his hands off the plow in order to run to the next sign and wonder. 178 miles is a long time to go from the first sign to the second. Hundred and seventy eight miles can feel like an eternity. I am not to do what I do even for the hope of another sign to come and you aren't either well this just got quicker there's another seven points <laughs> we won't need that Gary Tracy Like I said, this is the third time sharing this. And, and one of the times I was sharing it, well, every time I've shared it. Actually, this is the fourth time I've shared it because I shared it with Trish. I shared it with Trish one time, and then I've shared it with a couple others. And one of the times when I was sharing it, I was just sharing it because, man, I was excited. I had never made that connection. I had never counted the miles or tracked the left the levels of faith I had never realized or taken the time to realize because I was so focused on the obvious I had missed the strings of pearls that John sows into a beautiful word of God one of the times I was sharing it long before I saw the wow one of the individuals was wowed I love it when God wows. Not woe, but wows. God used these earlier to get you all, all of us ready. I believe with all my heart. They had no idea what direction I was going, but every song, God was plowing your hearts. Where are you 
in relationship to your faith and following Jesus. You need to stop waiting for a sign. It's already been given. And you need to run to him. I'm not talking about whether you're lost. At whatever point you find yourself in your life right now, God is saying, you stop telling me to come. You come. Take that step of faith. For some of you, it will be salvation. For some of you, it will just mean to go a little bit closer than you have been. Let's stand. Father. Father, cast the net. Draw. Transform. May you find submissive May you find me, may you find each of us rushing to you. May you not have to wait on us. In Jesus' name we pray.